Hey, welcome to the Wine Talks podcast with Paul Calmcare, and I'm your host, and we are having some fun today. This is the inaugural episode of the show, and you'll be seeing many, many more from us, including uh, some great uh, interviews with some of the winemakers from all over the world that we've interviewed here at the Wine of the Month Club. And I'm here being joined today for the first one. She's so excited is Molly Hill from Sequoia Grove. How are you, Molly? I'm great. Great to be here. It's so fun to have you here. We, we just got off the, off the set and did a nice uh, YouTube video and tasted some wines together. I've got Ed Massiana here. Ed, how are you? I'm just hanging in there. Huh? Glad, to, glad to meet Molly and taste some wines. Oh, sorry, Ed. Here you go. Oh, sorry, Ed. Okay, what are you going to do? That, that tells so, you Paul's here. <laughs> So the only problem today is that I can't put on my, my cow head or my horse head or whatever it is because I usually stumps them in the middle of the show. So, oh. so we're going to talk about natural wines today, but I don't want to get right to that subject because it's an interesting misnomer that's going on in the wine business about um, you know, what, what is a natural wine, biodynamic, sustainable, organic. We're going to peel those things back. Um, but I'm interested in just hearing a little bit about what's going on at Sequoia Grove. I, I, you mentioned that you have a brand new facility of making wines. and So tell us just a little bit what's happening over there. Um, yeah, I'm thrilled to just have completed the 2018 harvest in our beautiful new winery. Uh, we kept the look and the feel of Sequoia Grove, the very welcoming down-to-earth place. But um, we heavily invested in... Um, state-of-the-art winemaking technology. So you come to Sequoia Grove and you might not see where all the investment was um, because we firmly believe that we need to invest in bettering the quality of the wine um, rather than just the beautiful place to come visit. Although we do have a beautiful place to come visit. Yes, we're going to try and do that. Um, And we have an (laughs) in-house chef. She's already getting sort of Michelin star quotes out there on our online reviews. Really? Wow, that's exciting. Um, and she pairs our single vineyard wines, which are only available at the winery, um, with courses that um, she has specifically prepared with each individual wine for maximum customer enjoyment. You know, it's interesting to me because there are no, and this is not even on the subject, but there's no Michelin stars or even in the Michelin guide in Los Angeles. It starts somewhere north of, I don't know, Santa Barbara or after that where Michelin, and I don't know the answer or the reason for this, oh. but there's no Michelin stars in Los Angeles. There's really? No that, Michelin I, that's shocking. That, that's, Have you I, not heard that before? No, I haven't. Well, I haven't heard of a Michelin star in LA, but when you say that, it doesn't seem right. <laughs> There's a, you know, I use the app when I travel, particularly in Europe, because mm. Yelp and Foursquare and all those things are consumer oriented, and I really don't appreciate their opinion. So I use Michelin Guide, and if you bring it up right now on the on my phone here, you won't see anything in Los Angeles, not even recommended restaurants. Wow! Somebody pissed somebody uh, off it at must some be, point. Right? It's a political <laughs> thing, right? So there's this movie out. It's an older movie, but you know it's a French movie. It's very funny. It's called um, uh, Louis le, or le Cuisse. It's a, the wing or the thigh. It's a story. It's a funny story about uh, Monsieur Duchemin, who's the guy that supposedly owns the Michelin Guide. Uh-huh. It's a very funny, very funny, very funny movie. Get it with um, subtitles. Oh, because yes. <laughs> so. Don't speak French. Spanish, no French. So this... Um, uh, this idea here, the concept of natural wine, I, I've, I hear it all the time now. In fact, I'm reading this book right here called Venom Verum de Vino, and it's this iambic pentameter book about the wine business, and it actually has chemistry in it, and it talks about the, the you know, Mediterranean lifestyle, it talks about all the stuff that's good for you, but he uses the term natural wine in this book as well. And there are businesses similar to mine that sell only natural wines. I have winemakers come in here and say they don't understand what that means, and I agree with that. And so I was trying to peel it back and try to understand mm-hmm. what does it mean, this that. What is unnatural about a vine growing in some dirt that you water with natural water, and then you ferment into alcohol through natural processes, and you bottle it? So the, the concept is, for one of them, is um, it's sugar-free. So how many, how many grams of sugar, let's say, were in the, in the Cabernet we just tasted? It was fermented dry, and then nothing was added into it. So um, I'm guessing 0.2 grams per liter off the top of my head. So have you heard this term, Ed, natural wines? Oh, God, yeah. I I, I usually turn the other way. Well, well, because it doesn't make any sense. You know, certified organic has a meaning. There's 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 a group of people that you pay money to to come out and certify you as being organic. 
All right. There is no laws. There are. There's no system for identifying a quote natural wine, and even even the certified organic has a lot of flaws. I mean, 30 years ago, I was invited by Gallo to visit their vineyards in Sonoma, that were going to be completely organic and way past what the what the rules were for certification. I was blown away. I could not believe what they Gallo money. Come on, you know. But they're a hundred percent completely organic and. I mean, all the little areas that they had where they were fostering certain pests to kill the pests that were bad and growing certain plants to, to cover the plants that were bad. I mean, it was, it was fascinating. Absolutely Well, it is fascinating. fascinating. It's, it's very expensive to convert, and it takes many, many years, I think, mm. to convert to organic. Ah, but, the, but the operative word, Paul, is convert. They started they fresh. They started from scratch. They started but from you, scratch. But you can't, you can't unless it had not ever been farmed before. For, for bi- biodynamic and organic farming, you have to spend so many years... Uh, making sure the soil is clean of all its you know in toxins or toxins if there are any before you can do anything so if you're going to so if you are going to convert from conventional farming to organic farming which is i think a natural process right the organic farming i mm-hmm. think you can use as natural wine um you have to go through the process and then get certified based on the fact you waited and you cleared it this book i was talking about called the third plate by mm-hmm. dan barber um, talks about how the Americans butchered their fields going for quantity. And it, he also states in this book, you can't feed the world organically because it doesn't produce enough. Hmm. So you have, to, you have to conventionally farm to get enough yield to make enough wheat to feed the world that we already have starving mm-hmm. nations in. I would question that. I would wonder if that's really true. Yeah. Well, so, he's, so, he's, so here's the part that, that's interesting to me because he's, particularly with wheat farms where they plant, you know, between the harvest they plant other things and those snap peas for instance or asparagus whatever you want to call it right. that actually regenerate the nutrients of the soil and they he says a good farmer can look at the thing and you can validate this molly and look at the weeds that are growing and say yeah because there's dandelions we're short nitrogen or because there's whatever we're short you know potassium is it mm-hmm. yeah i think you bring up a good point and if i i don't can't speak for all consumers but if i put on my consumer hat i think what the consumer wants is they want someone that's in the vineyard that's not just throwing on something because that's what they did last year they want someone that is looking at the weeds in the vineyard that is taking care and attention and care and thought with every decision that they're making um, so I, I think natural wine is an indication that maybe more attention and thought has been put into the product, perhaps. No, I think that's valid. I think it's valid. It's just Ed's point being that there's no definition for it. But So there's a story in the book. Uh, actually, it's not in the book. When my daughter graduated from culinary school, Dan Barber was the keynote speaker, and he talks about Alanda Koss coming to the school for just a lunch and he's off on his way, and Alain de Caspi, one you know, the great chefs of the world, right? So he is tasting the butter on the bread, and he asked Dan Barber, uh, the, did you make this by hand, or did you use a machine? And Dan says, well, we've never made butter by a machine. It's all made by hand here. Doesn't say anything. They go on, and a little later, he says, the cows that made this milk for this, this butter, did they graze near the barn, where apparently it's more fertile? And Dan says, absolutely, that's where we graze our cows. Because, you know, the, the Blue Hill Farms is really on a farm. So a couple weeks later, Dan's in the kitchen, and he looks over, and there's an intern making butter in a Cuisinart. <laughs> and he goes over to the kid. He says, well, how long have you been doing this? He says, oh, I found a way to make it faster. It's been a few weeks. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> Didn't taste the same. <laughs> yeah, right. And then, uh, and, uh, I think the next week, I forgot the time frame, he goes out to the farm, and the cows are gone. And he asked the, the, the farmhand, where are the cows? He says, oh, I sent them to the South 20. You know, they're grazing out there to fertile. He goes, well, how long have you been doing that? He goes, a couple of months. <laughs> so he was able to taste the fact that the wine wasn't hand churned and that the cow, that the milk for the cows. So I think that's, and it, it bears out, you are what you eat eats, right? That's the concept. Right? Mm-hmm. And I think grapes, obviously, are the same mm-hmm. way. Yeah, I believe the butter story. And that makes so sense. So when I read in here, he says, this is, for instance, the conversation. The, the chef, the uh, author is Jean-Claude Hermant. He says, um, he says uh, anyone drinking heavily the night before and having to get up early in the morning should be advised to stick to natural wine. 
No, you should just be advised to drink less. <laughs> it's not true so much. <laughs> Come on. God. Okay. When, did, when does common sense fall into play here? That's what <laughs> no, I know. We're, we're not talking about common sense. We don't do Take that. a B100 and call me in the morning. So, Well, I just think that's interesting that he used the term. This is a contemporary book. It's a very interesting book if you haven't read it. It's very fast as far as like just yeah. throwing out facts. Perfect. But I just thought, okay, what does that mean? If I go to the store, like this morning, I, I have, now I'm aware of this, right? So I, I wake up this morning, I'm going to make a, a bagel, and my wife bought a sleeve of bagels, and it said natural on it. That, what am I supposed to mean by that? What am I supposed to take away from that? What's unnatural about flour grown in a field and milled somewhere? Mm -hmm. and I think farming by its nature is not natural. So if you really want to get esoteric about it, you have to go back to harvesting the wild grapes growing in the yeah, right. rivers. I suppose, right. Yeah. <laughs> you have to, yeah, right, bush grapes that no one's touched in 20 years. Mm -hmm. right, yeah, that makes sense. That okay. would be very certified natural wine. <laughs> so we were talking about, so when you, when you, there's, we know that in California, there's like a hundred, what, there's a hundred different things you can put in wine and, and highlight that. Um, I went to Rancho Cucamonga, which is the cradle of wine, you know, in America. And in California, it started in Rancho Cucamonga uh -huh. in the 1750s. And there's still vineyards out there. Wow. And one of them is a very famous family. I won't, I'm not going to throw any names out on these podcasts. I'm not going to throw anybody under the bus except Ed. And so... <laughs> so what a distinction. <laughs> so, um, so I went to taste some wine with him. He's still got redwood vats, you know, like, what are those, 1,500 gallons? Yeah, I, th I think you're about 1,500 gallons. Something like that. Really about and right. so he's pours off a Zinfandel, which is, I think, maybe not even a year old, and maybe it's the most recent vintage he has. This is many years ago. And it's like orange, just like this color, okay? And I go, I, I can't sir, tell my customers to drink this. It doesn't look right. He goes, ah, oh, we can fix that. And we went to the lab, and he opens the refrigerator. It's like a Norge, you know, refrigerator. It's old refrigerator, all rounded edges. And there's Pulled nothing in handle. it. handle. <laughs> there's nothing in it, except one bottle of, what do they call that stuff, Ed? Mega Red. Mega Red, yeah. One bottle of Mega Red. And he, and he takes a drop and he puts it in my glass and bing, you know, the glass changes mm. in color and everything looks great. I go, mm. you know, I can't do that to my customers. <laughs> That's just not right. But I understand there's a hundred substances approximately that you can put into one. Acidulate things. You can't put in regular sugar, right? No. Grape sugar? Uh-uh. I think you would have to dictate if you're putting in anything other than grapes and yeast. Yeah, okay. So when you're at school and you're studying biology and studying the analogy, were those, were there conversations like that about vinification and winemaking that you would you know you're allowed to put acid or whatever you could put in there or did you do that as an experiment yeah I think we're not um, opposed to that I I talk about it like the chef putting the right amount of salt on a dish so uh, the chef is an important part of your experience of an amazing piece of fish or meat or a, of a course they don't the best food that you've probably ever had has been minimally manipulated mm -hmm. but there is still a chef deciding when to take the meat off the oven deciding how much salt to go on it so we don't usually acidulate but if we need to acidulate I think of it like a little the right Just amount like of salt right to balance out the dish so it is an important tool that i wouldn't say i would never use i use only when necessary ed's quite the chef actually and he Thank actually you. he is very good he, and he's sous vide chef actually well, but you I were going to start that show you were going to you wanted to do a cartoon right an animation of well no cooking. what i what i wanted to do and i actually <laughs> uh, sold the concept to uh, the uh, pbs station in san francisco but this was almost this was 20 years ago and it was insanely expensive i wanted to show people via computer graphics what happens to food when you do certain things to it uh. like when you add salt the camera goes into the meat goes into the vegetable and shows you what it does how it changes the molecular structure of whatever it is you are preparing you couldn't find a small enough camera and so we couldn't well, no, no no i had to find <laughs> but the problem is you know it would cost ten thousand dollars a second back mm. then with what we had today I, I, I looked it up now you know you got guys will do it for that's know, jason he'll do it ten thousand dollars for, quite, for, quite for 10 minutes you know <laughs> I, mean, I would watch that, that but you fun. know and i had i had it all scripted out but it was just too expensive i mean i unless i get somebody to put up the money you know i'm gonna i was gonna prepare this dish and then show you what happens to it when you put it on heat you know when you 
when you do things that people think and have, have always thought that are absolutely wrong. Like when you put a, a meat on, on high heat, it's not sealing in the juices. It's robbing the juices. It's taking the juices out. You know, and I was basing so, everything on on what I read in Harold McGee's book, uh, the, the you know, like Scientist in the Kitchen, which is an amazing book. I mean, I've read it three times. I don't understand three quarters of it because he writes like a scientist. But if you read the same paragraph about ten times, eventually you'll get it. <laughs> you know? Let me ask you a question, though, since you're talking about cooking. And, of course, we could do this idea, by the way, this animation where it's wine, right? We go mm -hmm. into the, the fermentation tank with this digital... Uh, imagery of what what's happening inside that'd be kind of interesting actually particularly yeah. now you yeah but more it. people cook than make wine well okay so let's talk about that for a second if you because my daughter lisa being in new york she's uh, i told you her the, the yeast she's using i mean the, the starter she's using is from years ago that she started um so she's totally into food farm to table and the whole concept so if you took you went to ralph's and you went to the non organic section and you bought whatever you're going to make the dish out of and a complicated dish so there's enough flavors in it to figure it out and then you got in the best conventional you can find then you went to the farmer's market in santa monica which is a very famous place where a lot of chefs shop and you bought the same exact ingredients and you treated exactly the same way would you not taste the difference i don't think i could answer that question i, I don't think that question is answerable it, maybe in some cases it would I be and, and maybe some people would notice a difference i i would bet you that 90 percent of people would notice a difference unless there was striking differences i mean I you know i can be. i can you can't look at a tomato and decide how good it's going to taste you can you can look at a piece of meat and a piece of fish and decide how good it's going to be yeah but you can look at a truck coming down the five freeway that's full of tomatoes and the ones on the bottom aren't crushed that there's a problem well, with that tomato. That, that, that's a that's a different thing paul where i'm talking about you take an organic tomato and an inorganic tomato that are in perfect shape and they have perfect color and they have just a little softness to them it's really hard to tell which yeah, one's going to be so. better. What about how it makes you feel? Because like mm -hmm. your book, after you drink like a really good glass of wine or eat a really beautifully organic source, you feel better. It's like the life energy true. giving you life and, and you feel I think that's true. I, I think that's more mental and physical. <laughs> I, don't think so. I, mean, I, think, I think that the reason that we sit with a glass of wine and we emote over it, it when, when Santa comes home from work, my daughter, my wife's downstairs doing the accounting and making sure we're compliant with all the state laws. She says, I want a glass of wine. She's not saying it because she wants to catch a buzz. She's saying because she wants to feel something. And she's very particular about what I serve her. You know, I, she, I don't get away with much, right? Well, that's I, your fault. I, I, know, well, I try. <laughs> well, it's too late much. now. <laughs> so one of the things it says in the book here, it talks about sulfites. This is probably the most, you know, uh, oh. argued and uh, discussed item with wine. And, you know, the, it even talks about it here, and I've read this many times, there have been no real um, documented cases of sulfite allergies based on wine consumption. You probably have more sulfites at the Sizzler salad bar or an egg than you would on most bottles of wine. But you, I just threw away a whole pallet of wine I and mean, literally tossed it because it was made organically from the grapes to the process. Mm. And so it just didn't hold up after two years mm -hmm. in my warehouse. It just crapped out. I threw it away. Actually, mm. I gave it to somebody to distill. And I can't imagine what that booze tastes like. <laughs> it's probably <laughs> really pretty bad. But uh, he talks about sulfites. Um, you know, you, you, you put them sometimes on the grapes and they come in from the vineyard, right? Mm -hmm. to, in case it's a wet vintage or there's potential for mildew, you may dust a little bit. But when you're done with it, when you're, when you're bottled something like that, what is your typical when you're hand making these wines what's your typical level per liter of grams per liter of sulfite so when the consumer gets a bottle of our wine there's zero free sulfur in the bottle wow that's amazing um, so, so we have to differentiate there's free sulfur and total sulfur right yes right. yeah so the reactive sulfur is almost completely eliminated that's amazing so um, in bottling you're talking about minimal sulfur like 30 parts per million or something like that minimal sulfur and i would say the more you need to protect your grapes so perhaps this is a very generalization but the more microbes you have growing on your grapes the more sulfur you need to put in in the winery to prevent it may maybe it turning into vinegar or it turning into almost an undrinkable mm -hmm. product. If you are buying and growing really phenomenal quality grapes that have had attention to detail in the vineyard, you don't have to put a lot of sulfur throughout the entire process to have beautiful wine um, when the consumer opens the bottle. 
However, the the longevity of that wine is contingent slightly upon how much sulfur it does have. And if it has zero, is its shelf life gets kind of clobbered, isn't it? Yeah, I think the sulfur is an important part, but also the extraction of the tannins, the pH, the acidity, all of those things also help um, prevent oxidation mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and ensure that the wine is going to be fresh and lovely uh, when the consumer drinks it. I think the biggest misconception with consumers is sulfur in general and sulfites, which started in 1987 or when uh, the government said you have to put a contained sulfites warning on the label if it's over 10 parts per million. And I taught wine classes for 25 years, 10 years at, at, at UCLA. The number one question I got asked all the time is, well, I don't think I can drink wine because I'm allergic to sulfur. I said, if you're allergic to the amount of sulfur in a bottle of wine, you'd pass out if you were following a garbage truck because there isn't that much sulfur. And, mm -hmm. you know, quite honestly, 25 years ago, guys were putting in 60, 70 parts per million. Wow. You know, well, their pHs were too high. Their, their farming practices weren't as good. I, I talked about five or six winemakers for, for our discussion here. They all came up with between 30 and 35 parts per million. That's like half of what they were doing 10 years mm -hmm. ago. Yeast so, actually produce sulfur. Yeah, right. It does. It's well, part of the yeah, process, it's, right? It's, it's Mother Nature's way of protecting itself. An egg yolk has five, five parts per million of sulfur. So two egg yolks has to carry a government warning. <laughs> <laughs> two egg yolks are 10 parts per million. Uh, it's contained sulfites. I well, also this. compare it to dried fruit so what oh, well, dried fruit is more appetizing the, true, though, the bright orange beautiful apricot or yeah. the brown right, right. Uh, <laughs> you want to eat the bright orange fruit not the brown fruit yeah but you can smell the You're sulfur right. in those guys i mean <laughs> come on that's pretty high. and the, and it brought paul brought up the salad bars do you know what the parts per million in the salad bars were when this came into light 700 parts per million wow you can smell that across the room. Wow. Well, <laughs> well here's, I can't. This site, this website, I'm looking at saying that they're natural wines, and that means they're 70, less than 75 parts per million, which most wines probably are. Oh, absolutely. Unless they've been actually doctored up. Absolutely. Know, for no. But any estate bottled wine or recently made wine is going to be less than that, right? So that's kind of a bogus Well, idea. it really depends on the it's condition natural. of the grapes when they come in. You know, I mean, if... if you have to save the harvest because if that's how you make your money, you can't let things that sulfur will cure go unnoticed. I mean, you, you got to make money doing this, all right? And and uh, and there are times when you got to use a lot of sulfur. Now, in the finished wine, that's a different story because then you can then it could become a real problem. So there was that multiple genome de Bruzzo that the only time I've ever sent back a wine from Europe that was bad, and, and when you stuck the corkscrew in the thing, it actually released this gas that smelled like rotten oh. eggs. Well, that was, that's not, that's, that's remember that? sulfide. That and was that's Jean, Jean, into Jean Le Sec, I, told, yeah. I call Jean Le Sec, I said, yeah, it's yeah. on the street, you're just gonna stay there overnight unless you come get it, because I'm gonna bring it in the warehouse. <laughs> was it natural? Yeah, it was very natural, <laughs> more than natural. So one of the other things I talk about is alcohol content. I don't understand what that has to do with the level of natural bar, because alcohol is a very natural byproduct of fermentation, so I don't know what it matters if it's 13.5 or 12.5, except that Maybe that one degree or two degrees changes the caloric count of the wine or oh, the carbs, yeah. but I don't see that making a difference in natural. One of the other things I talk about is mycotoxin or mold. Hmm. Um, is that something that you worry about if, when it comes to just I mean, a general harvest or is it something that comes around from the weather? We're very lucky in Napa Valley in that it's an amazing place to grow grapes. So it doesn't rain March to November. Mm -hmm. We also don't have as high humidity as other most other parts of the country. So that's why Napa Valley and Rutherford particularly, where Sequoia Grove is located, is one of the best places in the world to grow Cabernet Sauvignon. You don't have to spray as much. You don't have to put as many inputs in to prevent mold mm -hmm. growing on the grapes, which then makes you have to do much more inputs throughout Later. the entire process to get a, a nice finished product or a reasonable finished product at the end. So would you, wouldn't you say though that if, if by the time any wine was got to bottling, it's it's mold-free? I mean, was, isn't it mold-free anyway? Just 
Isn't that what you do? would you buy a wine that has well, mold in all, it? Yeah, mold, you do not. I don't think mold can exist in an alcoholic environment. I wouldn't anyway. think so, right? But this I mean, is, even though thirteen percent, fourteen percent, what kind of molds are going to grow in that? Mm -hmm. I don't. I don't know. That's I mean, what I was trying to figure maybe out. Maybe less mold at the higher alcohol than the lower. Maybe. It just well, sounds probably. good. Does it sound good? Let me ask you a question. Does it sound good when you go to the store and you see a bottle that says mold free on it? <laughs> no, no, no. I I think they're hiding something. <laughs> do you remember when when I used to stock the shelves at my dad's store? In, in the California, this is 1972 to 78. It was, it would, we used to say 100% Cabernet. I think it was Sebastian. I can't remember the brand, but I remember putting the thing on the shelf going 100%. I mean, why do you care if it's 100%? Because back then, 51%, you could call it Cabernet Sauvignon. But then there was something there's something proud about saying it's 100% Cabernet. Well, yeah. Right? Yeah. Hmm. I mean, that became a big deal that in the 70s. You know. it's, it's, yeah, it's pretty funny label. These days, we put Merlot and Cap Franc yeah. to round it and soften it. Gee, I think where'd it makes you get a better that wine. idea? <laughs> <laughs> we did not come up with it. So yeah. one of the other concepts they talk about is dry farm versus wet farm. And I'm really having a hard time understanding the difference in the natural value, let's call it. The, I'm going to start that scale, the natural value scale. Mm. And we're going to start bottling wines with a natural. You know, they have the picante scale on the hot sauce. We're right. Natural value scale. Why would it matter? Uh, to call a wine natural, unnatural, if it's dry farm, but you know, Burgundy has to be dry good. farm. You know, it just sounds good. I mean, I just met Molly an hour ago, and as far as I'm concerned, her her wines are natural wines. Yes. Mm -hmm. Period. Yeah. Congratulations, what you Molly. You passed the Ed Massiana <laughs> natural wine test. God. So. We we do work with some dry farm grapes, so I think it's it's based on the site. So not every site. Again, I mentioned California doesn't rain March through November. Um, I think you need a little bit of water burgundy it rains through the growing season so they can afford not to not to irrigate um but some vineyards um are dry farmed and i think that is a unique flavor component that comes from it so let's going back to the subject matter would it would it be unnatural mm. to add water unless what kind of water you're adding i don't well, know but okay first of uh, all there is no there are no vineyards in south america that don't have drip irrigation. Okay. So they're unnatural. Argentina I mean, and by Chile definition. get zero rainfall. Zero. I mean, they get nothing, like six inches a year. Okay, you want to dry farm grapes? You're going to end up with raisins because I mean, there's, no, yeah. there's not going to be any grapes you can make wine out of. I just don't understand. So, I don't understand the concept that why somebody would tout their wine as that as being natural only because they had to water the vineyard. It doesn't make less sense. inputs. I mean, if you take it, it to the broader concept, I would say that it's less inputs well, right you I'll want buy that you know there's i am fascinated now we've been talking about biodynamic and all the rest of it but i am fascinated with the idea that a root will dig and seek its nutrients and why burgundy is so interesting in you know our in general is because it goes through so many different types of soil and rock and sediment to get to its nutrients and in burgundy it changes like across the street from one place to the other but I think that's fascinating. I think it does something to the grapes. I think it changes the character of the wine. I don't think it makes it any more natural or less natural, but uh, I, th I can see that. If, it, if it's one extra step to producing the wine, maybe that would be something as... Well, when you're charging $1,000 for a bottle of wine, you can afford that extra step. <laughs> what, adding a little water? <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> you could add more wine to it, you know? I mean, <laughs> it's a screw cap, too. That's yeah, extra, right. right? All right, so they add, I also add here, I don't... Um, Old vines, so, okay, fine. We get the we we get the value of old vines and the concentration of the fruit and the and the yields and all that. But I don't see why it changes the naturality of a particular bottle of wine. But I don't know. But hand harvested. How does, is that another input thing that we've well we used hands instead of a m machine? I, I suppose I don't know. The cotton gin changed the world. Why? Need a lot more hands to hand harvest <laughs> was, than one machine. <laughs> I mean, does that mean we have to go back to the champagne baskets on our back and carry the? You well, know, you know, I mean, uh, machine harvesting gets gets a bad rap by people who don't know what they're talking about. And when the first machine harvesters came out, let's face it, they were shaking the hell out of these vines, okay, to get the grapes off. Things have changed a lot since then, and they've gotten them narrower so you can do narrow spacing, so you can have 2,000 plants per acre instead of 700. So, you know, I mean. But is it more natural? It has nothing to do with being natural or unnatural. Well, that's the you point. Know? I mean, it really so does. I'm trying to tell you. you know? I think trying it's to tell care you. and attention. You want someone that's 100%. there 
looking after things every step of the way. And so who doesn't want that? That I sounds agree. good. I mean, even if you're using a machine, <laughs> well, somebody's got to right. guide the machine, you know, I mean, no matter what. And hand harvesting, obviously, it, by a trained grape picker is going to do better than a machine. I don't think there's any doubt about that. I think that the, your comment on uh, during the video was well received in that it, all these pieces end up in the bottle, mm -hmm. right? They all enter the bottle. I just, you know, still arguing this natural concept. Is it more natural, less natural? Okay, I suppose, you know, the extra idea that there's maybe because the tires are running through the vineyard and the and there's leaving residue from rubber i don't know what they even use rubber on those tires i don't know no they're just carrying phylloxera <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, no right. <laughs> please no so they're talking about um gluten free <sighs> what <laughs> is that is that a metric okay here's a question i have for you because i was asking my compliance officer who's in oregon if if there's a minimum requirement in the lab, you have a lab obviously on campus. Mm -hmm. I don't think you are forced to have a lab on campus to determine mm -hmm. what's in your wine, but you need to use a lab, right? We use our lab for tasting wine. We don't do much oh, really? lab you, in our lab. <laughs> you don't do much chemistry in your lab? It's in all tasting samples. <laughs> so, so you don't check, I mean, you must have the, obviously you know, the pH and the sugar content all that when you're done. So somebody does that, you do that there, I suppose. We do that, but that's less of what drives us. Taste is really what right, drives our decision right. making. You know, that's, I'm glad you brought that up. One of the things that I've been hearing from, particularly in parts of France where uh, the weather change and the climate change has changed the way they look, at, particularly in Burgundy, there's been some retrellising and the way they do the canopies have been changing because the weather's been changing on them. Mm. And, one of the things that many of the winemakers have talked to me about is getting away from the bricks test and some of the stuff you would do in the lab with a grape and coming down to the skin thickness and the taste of the grape and what's what's on the skin of the grape mm -hmm. rather than just the standard stuff. The little old winemaker of Italian Swiss colony yeah. 50 years ago. Yeah, yeah no, was. we're definitely in the vineyard. I think that's where we're determining harvest. I think all good winemakers are doing that. The numbers are sort of a backup to mm -hmm. be like, oh, did you look into that or did you think about that? But most good winemakers are doing things by taste and using all of their senses to so determine you know, things. You go home with a you know bucket of grapes and sit at the dinner table and start eating grapes for dinner is that what happens or no i can't actually eat grapes because <laughs> oh, i eat them for work so <laughs> give it to my that, kids huh? yeah well you know the problem with making wine by the numbers and, and, and I, one of my favorite stories i was up at ridge back in 1973 and i bought a bottle of their 1971 petite syrah and I, a case rather and wine was just unbelievable and i about 20 years later, I, ran, I was just about ready to open my last bottle. And I ran into Dave Benyon, who was the founder of the winery, and I said, hey, Dave, I'm just about ready to open the last bottle, 71 Petite Syrah. I said, that wine was just amazing. It must have been perfect. He said, let's see me think. Now, as a matter of fact, I think we had some trouble with that wine. <laughs> uh, I think it was a little overripe. It didn't taste overripe to me. Well, then the pH must have been really low. He said, no, I think the pH was around 4 and I went, well, then can you explain to me how this wine lasted 20 years? He said, I have no idea. <laughs> and the fact that he remembered about the vintage. Oh, yeah, that's Dave pretty incredible. Anything. He was an amazing guy. So cool. So uh, we never got off the subject. What is gluten? Is gluten in wine typically? Or do we, would you know this? So I did have to look into this because we do get this question. Oh, my God. Um, and <laughs> there is a wheat paste that the Coopers use to seal the heads onto the barrel what? i'm like what so that's debatable that. like i don't think gluten-free is as strict as vegan right so it, maybe the wine can touch the wheat paste um, but i don't think it's actually in the wine um, but and i talked to one of our coopers and they've actually gone to a food grade wax to do this oh job my now goodness. so that we're going towards completely gluten-free wine. Well, but you, you you said it right. It would take, it, uh, vegan is different than gluten-free and that gluten have to be in the product. Whether it touches on it, it matters as long as you're not ingesting it because it's an allergy and whatever the you know health issue that the person has that can't right. have gluten. Vegan is like no way. Can't even touch. Um, nothing. Product. Like I had John Sally in here, the famous basketball star, and he was, mm. he was selling vegan wine at the time. Mm. It's a whole different conversation. <laughs> I want him back in here actually to talk about it again, but he wasn't wearing leather pants. He was trying not to wear leather shoes. 
but he goes, I can't find anything that's like size 16 or 18 or whatever you wore ah. that doesn't have leather in it. So he's so vegan that he's not going to even uh, you know wear clothes that have that have animal products in it. So, but so then that is always a question about vegan and wine. So do you use egg whites when you find things? Do you use animal products to find or filter? Um, we do as necessary. So uh, I can't stress enough that every lot is different. Every vintage is different. Mm-hmm. Um, so what we do or don't do in a particular vintage is really driven by the flavor um, and what we're trying to sort of um, with minimal inputs get to at the end. And that's maximum sight and vintage expression. Okay, so... Would you label something uh, if you knew that vintage was not, you know, you didn't use shell, uh, sh- what do they use? Uh, was it bentonite? No. Uh, egg whites and the, with the shell, the one that's based on seashells. Uh, if you didn't find with Diatomaceous that, earth? W- would you not label it vegan or just a little acknowledgement at the bottom of the label? I think we would have to consult. So technically it's not in the wine. So it has been, rem- if it is fine with that, yeah. it has been removed and just the clean wine has been racked That's off right. the top and the lees have been, you know, thrown, it, removed. recycled back yeah. into the vineyard actually is what we do. So John Sally was saying that he had trouble selling this vegan wine at the steakhouses. Which <laughs> 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 Did he, he said, laugh? I hope he laughed. Oh, yeah, he's, he's a very funny guy. It's a very funny video. But he, he said, I just put my finger over the name vegan, and I pour it, and they're like, oh, this is really good. He goes, yeah, it's vegan. <laughs> so <Uh-oh. laughs> Anyway, so anyway, the other one, this is this one fascinated me. This keto-friendly. So if it's natural, we sell wines that are keto-friendly. So keto is the low-carb thing, right? Or no-carb? No, that's, no-carb. that's uh, um, I don't know. High fat. High fat. No carbs. No carbs, yeah. But that's also, uh, what's his name? The guy who died of uh, running. Um, But how would a wine be keto friendly? Well, I mean. Can't be high fat. There's there's like less than a gram of carbs per ounce of wine. It's nothing. You drink a bottle of wine, you drank 26 grams. That's one sheet. That's one uh, uh, piece of bread. So I suppose that's the alcohol content thing. So it's 12%. If it's 13.5 or 14, which is the threshold for this particular company um that's too many carbs and then too many carbs is not keto friendly is that what it is hmm. i guess but but, but, but you know, what's the fractional what? difference between 12 and a half percent wine and the amount of carbs in a 13 percent? i don't think there's any i don't think there's any you know i mean it's uh it's it's a false argument it's setting up a straw man to knock down and say hey we beat this guy but he wasn't there in the first so place i can't tell you how he, he and i argued about this subject earlier and now he's agreeing with me so this uh, is really good oh <laughs> hey it has to be good i think if you're gonna use calories to enjoy something, you want it to taste really good. That's my true. Philosophy. Absolutely. <laughs> my, the my theory about the, w- the, the way people eat and how they gain we- weight is they eat more of the food they don't like, looking for some sort of satisfaction. When I cook dinner, when I have dinner parties, I may cook five or six uh, courses, but they're little tiny courses. They're two or three bites, and nobody goes home uh, full. But nobody goes home empty either, you know, and and there's always <laughs> enough food to go around. I mean, people eat way too much food, and That's, usually it's the food they don't like, mm. which, you know, is kind of counterproductive. But As far as you know, they go home, they get in the car, and yeah. oh, man, I'm starving. All I know I'm is I don't, have problems. Problems. I don't have any problem inviting people over for dinner at the last minute, I can tell you that. <laughs> I'm just not a job I get that keto-friendly burger yeah. that you promised me over there. <laughs> so the last... Well, but you know, it, it also has to do with overconsumption too. I mean, what is a what is a normal uh, amount of pasta? Two ounces. Well, you know, you're now at what, fifty grams of of carbs. My normal is a half an ounce, and people go, "That's a half an ounce. It looks so much more than that." Well, you know, I mean, and <laughs> so it's ten grams of carbs. You know, it's you, a course, not a yeah. It's well, a I course. don't think it's, that carbs have a very. But it's off the subject, but they have a very important part of your metabolism. You should have carbs. Absolutely. It gives you a lot of benefits, and that's uh, my gym that I go to three days a week. The guys always has a clump of rice and a clump of chicken and a clump of broccoli. That's what he eats every day. Hmm. And, and well, I, the Atkins diet doesn't want you to consume more than sixty grams of carbs per day. That's that's their kind of line of demarcation, and you'll lose weight. Well, I, that's look, why I, I lost forty pounds. 
sorry. I was going to say that's why I moved to da- Napa Valley because they don't use the word diet. That's, like <laughs> that's a four-letter word up there. Because <laughs> diet is in it, right? So we don't use diet. Yeah. And when you go to the press, you know, they, they, we had a steak over there. Wow, that was amazing. Uh, the restaurant, the, the pre- what's it called? The press, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So we sorry, what were you going to say? Uh, I don't remember. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> that's very important, though. Uh, so the last thing I say that these natural wines are mouthwateringly delicious as opposed to what? Uh, non mouthwatering. I don't know. Delicious. I mean, what these, look at the wines you just tasted. Those are mouthwatering. They're delicious. They're, they're, they're perfect. You know, I mean, yeah. um, you know, that the Cabernet reminds me more of Cabernets from the the sixties and seventies that were lower in alcohol. I mean, I, I I was fortunate to be able to do some tastings featuring wines from sixty five, sixty eight, seventy of Maya Kamis and, and, and uh, you know, Heights Marthas and Mondavi Reserves and things like that. Those wines lasted 40 years and they were only 12.5% alcohol, 12% alcohol. I don't think you can ripen grapes today oh, so they were natural. to get to 12% alcohol. Mm. Well, I mean, they must have been have green it. seeds in those grapes mm. at, when you're picking at you know 24 bricks because mm-hmm. your 24 bricks is now in July, not not September. Mm-hmm. <laughs> exactly, we're still bottling. Well, I mean, less. you know, it, as less. a winemaker, Molly, you, it's got to be very frustrating because people want lower uh, the press and wants lower alcohol. How can you give them lower alcohol in any flavor? Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, I think it has to be good. It has to be well crafted. It has to be have a lot of care and attention put into it. And I think all of that long list is really, I hope, what um, the consumers are looking for. And I say, if you're going for all of those things, invest more in your wine because the higher price point wine, usually you tend to get all of those things that you may be looking for in a finished bottle. That is true. Because of the hand, because of the attention that you're talking mm-hmm. about, starting in the vineyard, which is mm-hmm. important. Well, this has been a, a great pleasure to have you on the inaugural <laughs> podcast called Wine Talks. Now, this is a clever name. Somebody wanted to call it Wine Chats, and they want to call it Tasting Tuesday. And I'm like Wine Talks, like TED Talks. Oh, or good. Wine Talks, ah. as we were discussing. What's in the bottle talks to you when you drink it. Ah. And it takes you feel something. It makes you want to do something. It makes you want to converse. And I, I'm understanding that after all these years more and more and more that what's what's in the bottle it starts in the vineyard it starts in the soil and it gets through the hands of molly hill here at sequoia grove who she she influences the direction of the thing but she doesn't right like you said coaxes it to the bottle thank you both for being here today it's been a great pleasure i hope to have you back someday and uh and do it again we'll pick another fun subject thank you treat to be here cheers Mm -hmm.